All right, all right, all right. Welcome to another edition of Shabbat Lounge. This is Matt. And Jake here. We are coming to you today with a Nailed to the Cross. It's a new uh, episode that we want to bring to you, but we do, before we get into nail, Nailed to the Cross, Jake, how do they find us? Uh, you use the Google machine, you push in the Sabbath Lounge, and it will find us. Or your Duck, duck Go, or any other such search bar. Uh, we're on the YouTube. We're on. We got the TikToks going on. Anywhere you can find a podcast, just search Sabbath Lounge. And we appreciate somebody did give us a shofar, ooh, and a comment. Nice. And we really appreciate that. I think they couldn't find a shofar, but they found a horn. Okay, that works. And that's close enough. Yep. I think I have shofar because I downloaded a Jewish emoji ah. emoji thing, and so maybe you haven't done that, but you can do that. There you go. Send us some shofars. Yes, yes. But we appreciate uh, especially sharing it with anybody um, on cross platforms. If you want to share it on Gab, uh, we have a faithful follower who shares us on Gab on a regular basis, and we appreciate her. Yes. So uh, Also, go to the website, sabbathlounge.com. Yep. Find all the historical documents and stuff. Yep. So now we'll get into Colossians 2. Right, so and, this is part um, of the uh, apologetic series, right? Yes, so it'll be on the on the playlist and YouTube with Torah apologetics. Right. So, and this is going to be a several part series. So, in this one, right, we're just going to go through some introductory information. So it's going to be like part three parts, but with the introduction, it has four parts. Yes, that's confusing. Right. Yes. But so intro. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Yep. We'll, so, we'll figure it out. We, like have a, a we, have, we have the smartest audience in radio. We do have the yeah. smartest <laughs> audience. And, you know, it's just like a book. There's an intro and then there's chapter one. Right. So we just don't have a table of contents. Or an epilogue. Yes. Or, <laughs> or <laughs> any of that. <laughs> All right. So we'll get right into it. And uh, so we're going to take a look and see what does Colossians say. So in our introduction, we're going to talk about um, who are these people. You know, what, why is it called Colossians, Jake? Let's find out together, Matt. So when we look at a map of the ancient churches. That's a good place to start. Yes. Yeah, I like maps. Um, so this map's showing up a little fuzzy here, but you can see Colossae is down there by Laodicea. And so Laodicea is the church that you don't want to be a part of, the one that's lukewarm and he's going to spit you out of his mouth. So um, that, um, and but Colossae was very close to that area. Not right. that they were the same, but that's kind of the area. Uh, it's probably like Turkey-ish. Yep, you're in, in, Tur you're in Turkey. Yep. If you see behind this uh, map here, it does uh, the chart, it does say Turkey behind there. No. Oh. It does. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So that's that's where they are. Something important world. to realize when I first realized this, it, I thought it was a big deal. Um, so how close is Turkey to Israel? Uh, to the north. It's, it's not too far away. It's kind of far away, especially if you're on foot. Well, on foot, yeah. <laughs> But we'll get into that later. But in our modern world with airplanes and cars, it's not too bad. Right. Definitely definitely closer than Texas is. Yeah. So. All right. So Paul's letter. So Paul, you know, Jake, he wrote these as personal letters. Yeah. It's, and that, they're it's called interesting letters to... from Paul. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of interesting to think about that he's just sitting there writing some letters to his fellowship friends mm -hmm. that needed some help. And so the, he wrote these to a very specific people, very specific location, very specific moment in time. And he nowhere claims to be rewriting the Bible, but, but many people put that on him unfairly. Right. So do, Jake, do you think it is possible that uh, Paul would look at the way we've take, taken his words and um, have trouble with what we've done with it? Uh, I think so. I think uh, he definitely would. Um, what? Why don't you explain a little bit more about what you uh, what you mean by rewriting the Bible? I could see that being confusing for someone. Well, just meaning that um, we often 
when you the way I grew up in New Testament church, we it was like Paul rewrote the Bible and all the other stuff disappeared. And he said something. What I was taught is that he said said something new that had never been said before. And this was all new, and it replaced what was in replacement said theology kind okay. of thing. Yeah, and gotcha. so all that was old. No need to study the old, and uh, and I don't think anywhere Paul ever claimed to be doing any of that. Right. And if you were doing that, that would be kind of a big deal, and it looks like you would say that. Seems like you would. Yeah, and in fact, we know the prophets would have to have said that mm-hmm. because. Uh, he reveal he doesn't do anything mm-hmm. unless he reveals it through his prophets. So, so Colossae, as you saw in the little map there, was possibly the smallest of the three cities in the valley. So there's a valley there. Um, so this was a letter mostly sent, uh, most likely sent to the assembly there because of the personal connections of Paul to Epaphras, Philemon and Onesimus. So some people will call this Philemon. Some people say Mm -hmm. Philemon. Mm -hmm. I'm a Philemon guy myself. Mm -hmm. Philemon, yeah. Um, And because Onesimus was returning to Philemon in Colossae with Tychius, uh, if you look in Colossians 4, 7 through 9, and Philemon 10, you'll see him talking about that. Are there 10? That can't be right. Philemon mm-hmm. one ten, it probably is right. I think there's only yeah, one. probably so. Yeah. <laughs> there's only one not, one chapter in Philemon. Philemon. Yes, yeah. it's so definitely both, not ten. Both Philemon, who was a church leader and host, and Onesimus were members of the church in Colossae. So, and you read about that in Philemon and the Colossians. So, one of the problems that they had was the adoption of Hellenistic philosophy. And they observed these rituals and laws that had to do with food and drink, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths, worships of angels, false visions, asceticisms, mysticism, and many other man-made religious practices. Right. So I think that may be interesting to you. To right. Know. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's important to realize that um, they, they had taking taken these things that the the jews were doing and twisted them into uh different different practices based on those things that that they had seen other cultures do yeah yeah well and it had gone this had been going on for a long time it's not like they just did this you know that some of this was connected to you know maybe possibly thousands of years of practices Mm-hmm. And and they were trying to rob the things that Yahuwah made, and they're like, "Oh yeah, good, okay, let's do that day." And 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 still to this day, there are people in Wiccan who have a Sabbath, and the, and their Sabbath is on the Sabbath, I believe, but they are wicked, very wicked in the, you know what they're practicing, right? But yeah, and if you look at the, our discussion with. Uh, with Mr. Wilbur, right? Mm, yeah. Who wrote the book, mm-hmm. uh, Remember, Remember the Sabbath? The Sabbath yeah. Right? Um, if you look at our talk with him, um, then you'll you'll hear some things about, you know, why certain people, it was important to keep the, the Sabbath day as what the Sabbath was. A bunch of different cultural, you know, religious groups had their reason for wanting to keep the days the same. They mm-hmm. had their own Sabbaths, mm-hmm. basically. But this is so important in Colossae to understand that there were people who practiced a religion, who honored a Sabbath, who um, had festivals and had things to do with food and drink. So as as we read and look in Colossians, you have to keep that in mind that, um, that yes, of course, there are Hebrew people or Jewish people, if you will, that observed food and drink rules and festivals. But um, and, and so it can be confusing if you don't uh, take the time to kind of sort some of these things out. And I think many people have confused uh, some of these things and, and, and may not have realized that the people did, you know, had these weird things that they did, too. Right. 
and they had this uh you see this word there asceticism mm -hmm. it kind of goes in line with this the hellenistic uh practices of they're trying to do things to set themselves apart which is you know something we're familiar with <clears throat> and they're trying to uh be better by denying their bodies yeah. of certain things yeah which in this in that case which sometimes is good but they had taken it to a place where it was they're denying their body things that there's nothing wrong with doing mm -hmm. so and uh we cited a source there at the bottom that you could go uh, research a little bit more um, th th there if you want to do that. Um, moving on with the background, so we know that there was a large Jewish population because of the proconsul in La Laodicea from 62 BC. There is a record of the temple tax, and uh, that shows that there was a significant tax base of Jews out of Colossae. So you know, just historical evidence supporting the, that fact. And then you've got this Hellenistic faith, faith. This was the way of life in all of Rome. This is what they did. And so there's a source there for that as well. But if you just look up and Google Hellenic faith, faith you will find lots of information. Yep. Be careful. So, yes, <laughs> you may get more than you bargained for. So, but definitely you're dealing with a part of this culture that in Colossae was very pagan and there were some Jews there. And so you put all this together and you get Colossians. <laughs> right. The other part of this is the Judaizers, if you will. Uh, and so they, they were people who were clinging to maybe more of man-made pharisaical traditions. Yeah, so you have these two systems coming together. You have the Hellenistic stuff, and you have the uh, the man-made laws of the of the Pharisees, and it makes for some confusing situations for new so believers like, to well, come into. Can you can you off the top of your head think of a man-made law that the Pharisees tried to enforce that was absolutely not in the bit in the Torah or in the collection of the Scripture? Uh, I th yeah. Um, there's uh they would try to tell people they were not righteous if they didn't fast mm -hmm. or they would say on certain days or if you uh i think it's easiest to pick the ones that that yeshua would pick and one of them being the the washing of pots and hands before you eat that kind of thing and it wasn't just washing there was a way you were supposed to wash it right like so many times and they, they you know we had to let the water run down or, you know almost like a doctor you know there, yeah. there were there, there were there was like a way that you had to do it or you weren't doing it right right and and they would judge you by that and so you've got these pagan people who have their own issues and then you have the very conservative and i, I don't know that conservative would be is right but they um Compared to the pagan, I guess these would be very conservative beliefs, and they, there's a lot of clashing that happens in these two groups. And these uh, Judaizers who grew up in the faith are trying to force all these new converts who are just fresh off of, you know, having weird parties <laughs> right. um, and bringing them in, and uh, they, they just were. They just they extra. needed a letter from Paul to <laughs> yes. kind of straighten things out. They were a little stirred up. Yeah. So they were not they were in kind of chaos is kind of what you what it leads you to believe. There were some issues and so I think it's important how, Jake how in our studies about Exodus and that early church how is it like this this early church? So they had become embroiled in the culture they're living in. And uh, the culture they're living in is anti antithetical to Yahweh's paths. So um, when the uh, Hebrews come out of Egypt, they have to learn those ways all over again. Remember, they had known them before. Yah's people knew them before, and then he had to instruct them again. And it's the same kind of deal here, um, except they're not leaving the area they're mm -hmm. you know going to go 
forced from there. And... It's more of leaving Babylon metaphorically. Right. So, but, but yeah, the, there's a lot of parallels between these two. And, and, and um, it's important to see that and important to realize that the church and the Exodus was church, just like church in, in maybe a better way to say is a, a holy set apart people or an assembly mm-hmm. of people. Um, but uh, the concept is the same. Right. Church that we see in Acts and the writings of Paul was not new. Right. So that is coming to the end of our introduction of Nailed to the Cross. Right. So th- that's just our uh, heads up on what Colossians, the city right of Colossae, was like at the time and so we can have that background when we go into uh the detail of what the actual uh book of colossians is talking about yeah so just remember there's uh two main people groups uh you've got uh pagan uh uh, pagan people and you've got a, a what you would call jewish population but they were more closely to maybe what we see the Pharisees doing, and they were still um, holding to some of those things. And 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 even if that may be unfair to them, um, but they may have just been also just enforcing Torah Torah things like circumcision on people, but uh, they just they just didn't kind of have it right. They were. Um, making it mandatory for salvation and, and um, you know, not accepting people because they, they weren't where they were. Right. In their lifetime of study. Right. And so instead of, you know, letting people come to it as Yah leads them, they were trying to compel people. Right at the beginning going, you got to right. do this or you can't come here. And there were lots of things that they needed to work on and, and um, yeah, and the long game is eventually they can get to working on some of these things, but uh, first they had to start with some basic stuff and get that right before they. It's just just like in our interview with David Wilbur about you know if somebody is in a terrible sin and they come to saving knowledge of Yeshua, well, step one is to get out of that lifestyle or whatever crazy thing you're doing. That that's where you got to start. Yeah. And that's that's what the pagans, that's where they are. Exactly. So so we just encourage you to keep on listening, and we'll go into more details. So stay tuned for part two on Nailed to the Cross, a look at Colossians. Which is actually part one. Yes, it was actually part one. This is the introduction. Right. So part one is coming up. All, All right. right. Well, thank you for listening to Shabbat Lounge. This is Matt. And Jake. Signing off.